Hello, welcome to special lecture at Designing Urban Ecology, Viz 101A at the winter quarter of 2021. Uh, this lecture actually is in the week of the Martin Luther King's holiday, but I felt it was important to record this lecture myself and have it uh, available for you to view at, uh, at your convenience, or at least uh, this lecture would be helpful for your research as well as speculative design in this course. So the topic today will be the traditional passive cooling systems, okay? And this kind of continues from the last lecture where I talked about briefly how the traditional garden and water supply system from ancient Rome to historical uh, Islamic world uh, where underground water aqueduct system as well as above ground system of delivering water was very crucial and important to agriculture and parks and especially gardens. But there is another component that, uh, especially in the Islamic world, that was very important, particularly in terms of keeping buildings and spaces cool. And that was to use air uh, alone or in conjunction with water system as well. So let's begin with that. The first example I'm showing you here uh, is typically called wind tower, wind catcher, or wind scoop uh, in English description. I'm going to use wind tower. Uh, for this lecture and throughout this course, but uh, it is the traditional architectural element used to create natural ventilation and passive cooling in buildings. The wind towers comes in various designs. They are unidirectional, meaning that it cap captures wind from one direction or bidirectional two sources or two uh, uh, directions and multi-directional capturing wind from all around the wind tower. Basic idea is to uh, catch prevailing wind uh, that is flowing through the city by building a high tall structure, a tower uh, above the building or the towns. It's actually kind of opposite in a way, when you think about it, uh, what normally that we think about chimneys are used is actually uh, chimneys are for exhaust. In other words, taking air out of the building interior out to the outside. In this case, it's opposite uh, to bring air in from outside into the building interior space as opposed to chimney that takes uh, typically associated with, uh, let's say, uh, fireplace that are used to heat the building and to take the smoke out uh, from the building, right? Now, the wind towers were widely used, particularly in North Africa and in Western Asian countries around Persian Gulf, such as contemporary Iran, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and other Central Asian nations and have been used for past 3000 years. So the technology of this is quite ancient, meaning that it has been in use from very long time ago, but it's also become traditional because it has been used for three uh, millenniums up to uh, modern period when we start to invent and make mechanical devices to cool uh, 
air in our buildings and spaces through either a fan, electric fan, of course, uh, air conditioning uh, system. Here's another example of an eight section wind tower uh, and near Asuk Wakif at Doha, a city of Doha in the nation of Qatar in the Persian Gulf. And uh, the tower is in this case, very, very integral uh, with the, the architecture uh, buildings around it. And, uh, and the, the tall structure above it, uh, the, let's say in this case, what looks like a third floor, eight section, meaning that it has basically at the top uh, eight holes, two on each side. So this is a multi-directional wind tower or wind catcher. The, where, where the air goes in, unfortunately, in this presentation that I'm doing, uh, does not show the mouse. I have to figure that out eventually, how to do that in this uh, keynote plus slash Zoom presentation, okay? But it would be kind of directly underneath top of the tower. You see a little shadow holes, uh, and that's where the errors are captured in. And this is actually a section of a building, uh, meaning that a building or house in this case maybe, is cut in half like a slice of bread or your, uh, your birthday cake and showing that what it looks like if you do that. And you see kind of, a, uh, let's say, um, uh, what's the, um, you see kind of triangular uh, line at the top, that's a roof. And, uh, and then below the second floor and then a larger space at the bottom is the main space on the first floor of the building. And you see the how wind catcher in this case, uh, in, on the left side, catches air, bring it in to the interior of the house, and then uh, it pushes out uh, at the center of the house, as well as on the right side of the house. And the whole opening of the wind catcher or the wind tower has to be designed in the way to face the prevailing wind. In other words, that some city or some towns that this house might be located, the wind may be coming from the north. Then you put the wind tower in the north side. If it's coming from the south, then you put it on the south side. So it's important that you understand the, the uh, kind of uh, seasonal uh, prevailing wind of the particular place that you're located. If you put it on the opposite direction, it would not catch any wind. So you're basically wasting a construction of wind tower. Uh, it becomes useless. So in the pair, in this case, that the, the uh, cross ventilation uh, is created inside the house and uh, and the, you can also see where the dust is deposited on the floor where the wind catcher uh, is bringing the wind in. Now, the reason why that I show this previous image is that how the air circulation, the natural air circulation uh, is used by uh, the force of so-called buoyancy, which is, uh, it, which is a physics term and uh, how air moves from, um, let's say warm to cold in direction or from lower to higher grounds in space. So I'm showing you here an image of a courtyard in Palazzo 
Vecchio in city of Florence in Italy. And the reason for this is that just like the previous image, I've shown how the air comes in to the building and is funneled out in this case at the tower at the very center and top of this house. The same system is kind of used. <clears throat> in this case, the courtyard is used to draw the air from outside on the ground floor. And then the hot air that rises uh, higher is forced, pulled out at the very top of this opening uh, that looks like a tower with other upper floors facing it. So air, hot air is drawn out, cold air is pulled in from below, therefore make uh, the courtyard that you're standing in, the person that taken this photo at the lower floor would be very cool. So at the bottom of this tall, narrow tower with the opening at the very top that draws hot air out and cool air in from the bottom of the building lies a fountain uh, that, sprouts, uh, that spouts out very thin stream of water at the bottom of this building. And that is directly underneath this opening in the courtyard. And so at nighttime, it draws out cool air and uh, cools the entire uh, building down. And so that the mass of the building, uh, the structure and material of the building uh, holds the cold air, uh, pulls in at night and actually kind of works as a sort of an iceberg, so to speak, that during the daytime draws the coolness, releases coolness out uh, through the evaporation cooling that through the draft that uh, goes up to the top. And so over uh, during the day, it keeps the building and the interior spaces much cooler than the outside by retaining that evening temperature. And in the reverse, obviously during at night, it keeps the building warmer than the outside. So it kind of balances out uh, the temperature uh, within the building throughout the day while outside uh, changes dramatically from daytime to the night. So here architecture kind of works as uh, like a heat exchanger, if you will. And, uh, and so this is a combination of how water and air, and in fact, the building itself in this case is much significant, uh, let's say source of cooling and warming the building. Nevertheless, uh, the point is that a lot of, this is different building, but you see that it has a kind of a, a wide expansive uh, space uh, protected by the ceiling and the roof away from the sun, thus keeping the rooms everywhere in this building relatively cool compared to outside. And you can see at the center, there is a pool of water that works uh, as a kind of evaporative cooling uh, passive system where the warm air from outside the building comes, when it comes in, it's cooled by this water and the draft of air moving from outside to inside creates enough circulation that works as like uh, fans at the air conditioning uh, unit. 
So this kind of uh, previous uh, photos in this courtyard, uh, I don't know what's at the bottom, but it is said that it has a water uh, fountain at, at the bottom. Could easily have exactly like in this picture, a pool of water and that would uh, together uh, with the uh, uh, airflow that the architecture itself works as a kind of air conditioning system. Now, this is the uh, 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 city of Matera in Sicily, Italy. Sicily is an island at the very uh, southern end of uh, Italian peninsula. Uh, in fact, an often Italian peninsula is shaped, uh, people call it like a boot. And Sicily in this case would be at the end of the bottom of the boot. You might say maybe it's like a soccer ball being kicked by a soccer player's uh, boot. Matera is an old city that uh, in the previous lecture by architect Alexander Valentino about uh, his kind of presentation of Italy and Naples focused on, he did show also some uh, part of Matera, how the water works in the city through the building as a kind of uh, system that flows down through a series of uh, channels, water channels and cisterns and et cetera, uh, that help to not only provide water for consumption, but also act as a uh, infrastructure citywide cooling system. And part of the reason why this happened was that, that the, where the city was situated in its topography, uh, for much of the reason for defensive purposes in the old days, it was, it was positioned in a place where surface water was very, very limited. And so the inhabitants of Matera spent enormous effort and engineering through its history to find the water below the ground under the city itself and have invested tremendous effort uh, to create a source of water uh, that could provide for its population. So as a result, that there was a huge series of, not just the, uh, the kind of a domestic size cisterns that were built underneath uh, every homes or most homes uh, carved out of the rock uh, formation which the city itself was sitting on. But some of these systems were quite large and they became sort of a public source of water. And one of the largest one underneath the city is uh, this cistern Palombaro Lungo system, system. And here's a picture of today that, uh, uh, that uh, there are kind of bridges built for tourists. Uh, this is now a tourist destination as well. But you can see incredible effort that was made to carve through solid rock formations to excavate this kind of underground space uh, in order to draw the water from the ground. In other words, that you had to have create a space underground, a cistern that is, to not only hold the water as a source for consumption, but in fact, the most important thing was to draw the water from wide range of uh, uh, a water source that were throughout the underground. Maybe the best way you could say is that this uh, cistern system 
would be kind of inverse of a uh, roots for trees, okay? Let's say if you conceive the town as the city itself, Matera, uh, city of Matera, and the buildings, architecture in there, instead of thinking them as a building, if they were, if you think them as like a tree, uh, so in other words, Matera, not as a city, but as a forest. Underneath forest trees, there would be set of roots dig going underneath. And the root is not only to stabilize the tree, but the most essential thing is to get water and nutrition from the ground. So the cistern uh, is a kind of negative inverse uh, roots for these trees or roots of the city of Matera in which that it draws water from vast area of, of underground uh, 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 territory and the water falls into this open space and it collects them in other words not only hold them but also collect them Here are some more pictures and when you, of that cistern. And when you think about it, that I don't actually know when this cistern was built, but my guess would be, and you can research on this, is that it's hundreds of years old, if not maybe even a thousand year old, right? And without the kind of mechanical tools that we have today, that they have practically carved this thing out of hand tools is really, really extraordinary effort and engineering, much to be appreciated and much to be respected about ancient systems uh, that uh, people have created. So another example is this St. Patrick's well or Pozo di San Patricio, a historical well in a town of Orvieto, which is in central Italy. And uh, this was uh, built by architect engineer named Antonio da Sangallo, uh, the younger of Florence between 1527 and 1537. At the request of the Pope Clement VII, who had taken refuge at Orvieto while the Rome was being sacked by an enemy, whom I'm not sure who that was, maybe the Ottoman Empire. And uh, the, as the Pope Clement uh, was taking refuge in this town, he feared that city's water supply was not su sufficient enough in the event of a siege by an enemy. So the well was uh, ordered to be built and it was completed in 1537. And what you see in this picture is that, again, uh, you don't see the city of uh, Orvieto, but it's another typical Italian hill town, a fortress uh, town built high above uh, uh, one of the high points of the, uh, the area. The round structure you see is top of this well, and again, this is now a tourist uh, location. And the name uh, 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 used as a Saint Patrick Saint uh, Saint Patrick's Well was inspired by medieval legend of the Saint Patrick's Purgatory in 
Ireland. Uh, and uh, it was kind of, uh, let's say representation of purgatory because it was dug incredibly deep into this uh, rock formation. So here is a picture of what it looks like if you enter that uh, round structure, it goes deep underground, as you can see here. And the illustration on the left is actually a section of uh, showing that uh, structure. Uh, there is kind of two images here. One is the uh, image of the kind of a cavity uh, that you see in the picture. Uh, and then the kind of black, uh, uh, I'm sorry that I can't get a, a mouse here, but the, the black vaulted uh, kind of uh, vertical or uh, rectangular shape on both sides of the cavity is actually uh, hallway, a stair, okay? I think you will understand better uh, maybe when I show you the video of it. But the, um, the illustration on the right of that uh, called Profilo written on is the staircases that goes down to the bottom of this well. And then the round circular uh, illustration at the bottom of these two columns of drawings is pianta, which is a plan. And it shows that basically it's a double walled uh, with a cavity in between that is spiraling down staircases. And the final central circle is exactly what you see in the picture looking down to this water well. And so the way it was designed was that it has two helicotal ramps in a double helix. In other words, that two spiral cases that are actually double that are interlocking each other uh, and uh, which allowed mules to carry empty and full water vessels separately and downward direction without an obstruction. In other words, that there are two staircases that are winding uh, each other, but separate. I don't, it's difficult to explain, but that's what a double helix is. Maybe if you look up double helix, maybe you understand. In other words, it's two uh, overlapping one-way streets, or in this case, staircase. So in one staircases, the horses goes down. The other staircases, horses go up with carrying water. They never meet each other. Uh, they are separated at all times. And uh, the windows provide illumination. Of course, then there was no electricity or electrical light. There were other uh, uh, means of lighting with oil lamps. However, that with the natural light, you don't really need it. And the cavern, the hole at the top was open uh, as opposed to now is, uh, and so the light will fall down, as you can see in this picture. At the very bottom, you see it, uh, of this picture, you see a very bright uh, circle at the bottom of the well where the water is. It's a reflection of the opening at the top uh, of this uh, well uh, open to the sky. Uh, this is uh, well is 
175 feet deep with the base diameter 43 feet. So it's a quite a large structure. This is what a double helix looks like. If you look at it carefully, there are two parallel staircases winding down each other where they never meet. And then the picture on the, the model, three-dimensional model on the left side uh, shows that, uh, that there's double uh, uh, tubes, smaller tube inside, a larger tube outside. And in between those tubes are where the staircases are, as you can see in this picture. Now, this is at the bottom of the well, and you can still see that there's water uh, even today. Uh, obviously, the, the, I think the stair, uh, I mean, the, the bridge that ran, run, runs over the well, I'm not sure if that was the original. It looks like it's new. There may have been a bridge before in order to, uh, in ancient time, in order to span over the river, I mean, the, the water of the well and make more accessible to get water uh, from the bridge. Okay. As you can expect that as the water fills, sometimes it, it would go up higher and then you would be able to get water from at different heights of opening that you see in the inner uh, uh, wall. Uh, so it's kind of like what you see in uh, big uh, gas containers that now you don't see so much, but they had a metal structure that is a round structure. And then within it, there was a contained uh, volume that goes up and down depending on how much uh, fuel was inside. As you put more fuel inside, it goes up higher level. When is less, it comes down uh, more closer to the ground. This is would be uh, in terms of similar idea, but <clears throat> it would be in opposite direction. So he, this is a view from uh, below looking upward, looking toward the sky. So I'm going to show you now the video of that well. Il Pozzo di San Patrizio in Orvieto è una struttura costruita da Antonio da Sangallo il Giovane tra il 1527 e il 1537 per volere del Papa Clemente VII. Reduce dal sacco di Roma e desideroso di tutelarsi in caso di assedio della città in cui si era ritirato. I lavori del pozzo, progettato per fornire acqua in caso di assedio o calamità, furono conclusi durante il papato di Paolo III Farnese. L'accesso al pozzo, capolavoro di ingegneria, è garantito dalla singolare trovata architettonica della doppia rampa elicoidale che permetteva alle bestie di Soma, utilizzate per il trasporto dell'acqua, 
di non ostacolarsi nel doppio senso di marcia lungo i 248 gradini. Particolarmente suggestivi poi i 72 finestroni che lasciano filtrare e giocare con le tonalità della pietra la luce. Le misure del pozzo sono enormi, 54 metri di profondità e 13 di diametro. Well, I hope your Italian is better than mine. So here's another drawing of another structure, but it actually in principle, the system is very similar. In this case, actually there are much more rings uh, uh, let's say four rings instead of uh, two rings uh, or barrels that we saw in St. Patrick's well. And this is a well for the citadel of Torino in also in Italy, uh, a city that is actually in the north uh, western part, uh, part of the Italian peninsula or one could say the beginning of the, the Italian uh, uh, Riviera uh, before it becomes the French Riviera along the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, this citadel uh, and this well provided perennial water source and it also has double helical ramp, similar to the one that we just saw in uh, St. Patrick's uh, well in Orvieto. This, was, uh, this uh, uh, well is called Pozo Grande, which probably means big well uh, or great well. And this was designed by Francesco Pacciotto. Uh, he lived between, in, in, he lived in the uh, middle of uh, pretty much most of the uh, 16th century. And it was a part of a large construction of the citadel. Uh, and uh, the two overlapping and independent helicordial ramps were built within two concentric masonry pipes covered with barrel bolts, paved in bricks, and illuminated by means of large windows open in the internal open air cylinder, very much like uh, the other well. At the center of the well is a large circular basin for a collection of water, bordered by low masonry parapet. And in 1607, with the construction of column loggia above, which is the like the architecture that you see uh, on the uh, in this illustration uh, on the left side on top of uh, the plan or the plan view from above of the, the double barrel corridors. This is what you see above the ground. So above the ground of this well was a, a building, uh, a circular building in architectural, uh, giving an architectural presence and, and, and spaces. And uh, the building above the ground was completed in 1607. So it was added much later, let's say, you know, almost 40 years uh, after 
the well was built. And this was probably uh, uh, to give the well more of a public space for people to use and enjoy even. So this is what you see if you take a section of that. In, other words, in this case, the drawing is uh, isometric drawings. Uh, it's a three-dimensional drawing technique. And then let's say one quarter or maybe even one third of the building was cut away to show you uh, interior of the building, okay? And you see at the bottom, uh, the, the drawing shows even horses uh, down there. Uh, and uh, they, they would probably use, just like in St. Patrick's well, used to carry water up through the, the ramp uh, be, in between the court, uh, the, the barrels that we're talking about, concentric barrels. And it was used uh, almost for a century. And, uh, but in 1689, the roof and entire uh, column logia were dismantled, in other words, structure of the ground with this, uh, to dismantle logia would be kind of a circular corridor that goes around, arched corridor around the, uh, the main structure of the well. And then it became ruined partially at the end of 1830. And after further destruction, caused during the siege of the city in 1799, it was abandoned and, uh, and bur buried. And many of these wells, uh, big wells like this for public use and private well, much smaller uh, in a small community or even individual homes were basically abandoned and buried over time. Now, I wanted to kind of show you a kind of interesting comparison uh, because this building, which is not a well, this is actually an apartment building called Pante Tower uh, in Johannesburg, uh, South Africa. And this was once, uh, it was built 1975 and it's quite tall. It's like 567 feet tall, which was tallest residential skyscraper in Africa. This 55 story building is cylindrical with an open center allowing additional light into the apartment. And exactly like the well, two wells I've shown before, the design and the structure is identical, except that between the double barrels, in this case are apartments, not uh, staircases that carries horses with water up and down the well. When built, Pante City was considered to be an extremely desirable address because of its uh, high quality of building, tremendous uh, location and spectacular view of the city and its surrounding. In other words, that it was one of the top class luxury apartment building at the time. However, during 1980s, late 1980s, gang activities became common throughout this area, uh, largely because after apartheid uh, ended, uh, white people kind of moved out of the city center. And uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Africans or black Africans begin to move into the city as the white begins to leave. Um, and, uh, and much of this was uh, uh, demographically in poverty. And of course that there was tensions, racial tensions. And as a result uh, that the city became uh, very, very, uh, let's say, unsafe, high crime rate because of economic uh, difficulties of, and high un unemployment. As a result, gangs move into this building. 
as the uh, white professional or well-to-do tenants moved out and it became extremely unsafe and the building became symbol of crime and urban decay. And the court that the center you see here begin to fill with garbages. People threw the garbages out the window into the, this giant cavity. And uh, it became a giant rubbish t uh, pile start to rise up. In other words, instead of well that had water, this actually ended up containing rising mountain of garbages. Now, I've heard first when I found out about this building, uh, which uh, even in 1990, there were proposals to turn the building into a high rise prison. And in fact, you can see the picture at the bottom, uh, you can see the kind of level of deterioration. It was a structural deterioration is taking place. And uh, there was a rumor that this was a place where uh, killings occurred by pushing people out the window or uh, people came to this building uh, and committed suicide through this well uh, into obviously the pile of rising garbage uh, in, as well. So it was kind of a wasteland, uh, kind of a, a burial ground for uh, commodities as well as uh, human beings. But to go to the brighter side, and I'm showing you several examples of different variations of the wind catcher or wind towers. And this one is actually in the uh, city of Yazda in Iran. And Yazda is known as a city of wind catcher because there are so many of them. And that's because the city of Yazde is in a very extremely hot, arid uh, area of the country. And uh, so that people uh, really depended on wind catcher uh, to keep uh, their city and the buildings cool during the day. And this one on the left is one of the tallest uh, remaining existing wind catcher. And the holes at the very top is where the wind goes through. The kind of vertical recession at the upper half of a tower is actually kind of drawing the cool air up toward the very top of the tower. And then the openings at the lower, uh, more, uh, up, uh, let's say, I can't tell whether it's octagonal shape, probably it's octagonal in plan. Uh, bottom building, you see series of kind of openings, large openings, and that's where the, it's, it's also corridor or logia uh, hallway, arched hallway. That's where air gets sucked in into the building and then it goes out through uh, the top. So the tower basically catches water, I mean, uh, cold air into the building, but also takes the hot air out of the, uh, through the tower as well. The uh, image on the, on the right side is uh, you have a vertical towers, but you see a more like a dome like a structure that is able to carry, to catch wind in a much uh, uh, a larger di diametric uh, configuration. Here's another uh, image of a building. Uh, this building, I believe, also in Yaste. 
And this is a, a private mansion. And it has many wind towers uh, at different levels. And what's also very, very interesting here is that when you see an image at the bottom right of this picture, you see how the building is completely open and the outside space goes into the building, penetrating inward. Uh, and there's just a really large opening uh, to the outside, which is to bring air, cold air into the building. And they are kind of carried out through the corridor throughout the rest of the building interior. So the corridor in this case works like a duct system that you have in our mechanical uh, cooling and heating system where the furnace or air conditioner, air, cool or hot is funneled through a series of duct to take it to different rooms. Uh, in this case, the hallways are used as a duct system. Most of the, these buildings were constructed from thick ceramics with high insulation values, as well as they have thermal mass to hold heat or uh, cold. Town and desert oases tend to be packed very closely together with high walls and high ceilings, maximizing the shade at ground level. Heat of direct sunlight is minimized by having small windows outside uh, and uh, small windows toward uh, this uh, view where is face, uh, I'm sorry, small windows in order to uh, limit the penetration of sunlight inside the building as much as possible, therefore protecting itself from the heat. And this is called Yak uh, and it's Persian. Uh, of course, I'm, you know, completely screwing up pronunciation. Yak means ice, Chai means pit, and in fact, it's ice pit. It's an ancient type of evaporated cooler. And what you see above ground, like a dome uh, shaped structure, but underneath below it had subterranean storage space. It was often used to store ice, but sometimes was used to store food as well. And this subterranean space is coupled with very thick heat, heat resistant construction material to insulate the storage space year round. And obviously it helps because it was below the ground, benefiting from uh, the, the lower temperature of earth compared to above the ground, high, hot temperature exposed to the sunlight. These structures were mainly built and used in Persia. Currently we call it Iran, Persia, often was much, much bigger than uh, uh, in, in territorial size than contemporary Iran. Many that were built hundred years ago remain still standing. And this is an image from interior of Yakchal, uh, looking upward uh, to the top of the dome uh, where there was an opening uh, for uh, light. Water is often channeled from a canat. The underground aqueducts that I des described about in my previous lecture, which drew underground water at a low temperature and kept it in low temperature because aqueduct was underwater and not exposed to heat and sunlight. And in the combination of subterranean insulated uh, round structure fed by 
cold water from Kanat underground aqueduct. And sometimes that, that water freezes when the temperature is low enough. And uh, so this is a really intensively well-designed, well-built uh, ice box, okay? And uh, a wall was usually built in the east and west direction. Uh, and incoming water is channeled along the north side of the wall so that radiating cooling in the shadow uh, uh, of the wall, it cools water before it enters Yokchon. Ice is sometimes brought from the mountains and stored in Yakchar, and because it is kind of refrigerator itself, that ice from the mountain would remain as ice throughout uh, the year, uh, or at least the summer period. And people uh, went to this place to get ice, or make, uh, not ice cream, but I think Persians have a very a diff, uh, another kind of uh, dessert made out of ice, uh, traditional uh, dessert. I, I forgot the name of it, but you know you can find it. So I'm showing here a, a project by an architect, contemporary project by a contemporary architect that uses the uh, a similar kind of old traditional system uh, to create an uh, environment that was a passive uh, system for heating and cooling. And this is called Earthship. And uh, it was, uh, the idea was to have a passive solar earth shelter that is made of both natural and upcycled material such as earth packed tires. And it was designed and built by architect Michael Reynolds. And uh, you can find this if you type in Earthship, you can find it in the internet. And uh, so this is a view of it, exterior view of it. And uh, it's much of this space is actually buried underground, so to speak. Uh, but it's best to kind of show you the section of it, where here's a section. There's obviously on the right side, there's a greenhouse taking advantage of uh, summer sun, probably facing south side. But the point that I wanted to show you is that on the left, there's a warm air drawn in to the home by natural force of convection or buoyancy. And uh, it goes through a tube uh, below the earth. So it gets cooled down. And then you can see the temperature changes from uh, uh, reddish to blue, meaning that as it goes through this passage, it gets cooler and cooler. And then it is released inside the space and then it's sucked out at the top through like a chimney like uh, a system, right? So this temperature change or buoyancy or convection is naturally moving the air from the left to the right of this structure. In other words, it is not uh, done by any kind of mechanical devices or uh, uh, artificial energy uh, or fans or anything. It just uh, happens by uh, the natures of the physics. And this is actually a, what is described as a heat sink. In other words, uh, this kind of uh, cell-like series of a, a flat uh, metal planes uh, that is uh, 
I don't know what the word, the kind of very cellular, almost like a waffle-like arrangement, is to create a much more surface area uh, that is interacting with outside air. Therefore, that it can actually release heat and cool off. So this is kind of like a, a, a heat exchanger uh, that you would find in a lot of air conditioning system. Uh, this is where the heat from uh, the system is released to the outside. And you need to get that heat out in order to uh, the whole system work as a cooling unit. And I think that I'm putting up these words over here like convection, heat conduction, conduction, advection, free heat convection, convective heat transfer, heat sink. I think these are important keywords for you to look up and you can actually kind of look up, uh, actually Wikipedia might be the best because you get a kind of general understanding about what these keywords really mean in scientific and in physical sense in which that I think you begin to like maybe to uh, be introduced to uh, uh, a system which you would be able to use in your spectrum design when you're designing a space and system and structure to use water with air to cool space and, uh, and the buildings down in the given uh, future site that that I will give to you, both in the city of Seoul, South Korea, and Naples in Italy. Um, the convection in, in here, in this illustration, is a transfer of heat due to bulk movement of molecules within fluids such as gas and liquid, including uh, molten rock, and it includes sub mechanism of advection, directional bulk flow of transfer of heat, and diffusion, non directional transfer of energy or mass particle along concentrated gradient. In this case, I think this illustration is really uh, like diffusion. If you don't really kind of get this idea, I'll show you an example how that, that heat sink in the past, uh, this system becomes a small motorcycle engine. So what you see is that on the top uh, is a kind of configuration that is very similar to this image in which that this is where the heat generated by the engine of the motorcycle is transferred out, released out to the air in order to keep the engine from getting too hot, right? So in a way, it's a cooling system. And it's only done because this configuration of waffle shape or pancake on top of each other creates an extraordinarily large surface area so that air can draw the heat out from the metal. Similar system here is an old uh, called Sal Salasabil. Uh, this is in a red fort in Delhi, the capital of India. And here, this kind of angle shaped uh, surface coming out of the arched uh, uh, concave uh, area again uh, along the wall is that the water flows down from the top to bottom and as it flows it it, it sh in sheets of water and it is kind of uh, uh, rippled by these uh, kind of protrusions protruded design of the surface and it begins to maximize evaporative cooling surfaces. And this drives air circulation over this flowing downhill 
uh, direction of water. In other words, this is actually a heat exchange. Okay. Uh, in this case, it is actually not uh, taking hot air out of the, uh, the mass, but actually uh, releasing coolness out to the air around it or the space around this uh, flowing surface, like a better word, okay? This is a passive ventilation and that used to maximize the flow of unsaturated air over water surface and carry the cool air to where it is needed in the building. This sal salas sable, sable were often, often used with the wind catcher or wind tower. So the air from the wind tower or wind catcher would go over the surface, therefore drawing, evaporating the water that is falling down as a surface, uh, therefore be creating cooling effect. This is a building in Melbourne, Australia, council house number two. This is a, a, a office building located in central business district of Melbourne, which is basically downtown of the city. It's used by city of Melbourne council. And when it was completed in 2005, became the first purpose-built office building in Australia to achieve a maximum six Green Star rating certified by the Green Building Council of Australia. So like a hotel uh, or restaurants, the green environmental uh, uh, movement or institutions, or uh, let's say officials, uh, agencies, have star rating to give which buildings are environmentally most uh, 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 better designed, minimizing uh, environmental uh, harmful impacts. Uh, in other words, in short, short term, a green building, right? And the image on the, on the left side shows that it uses um, basically um, uh, sh shutter screens to block out the sun that is operable so that it moves along the movement of the sun to maximize protection, still while giving a view to outside because the rest of the surface behind it is almost all glass surface. You get a better view uh, of the whole building uh, on the image on the right side. So it actually is next to the original uh, first council house. Uh, and it is uh, designed to reduce compared to the old council house. It reduces electricity consumption by 85%, gas consumption by 87%, produces only 13% of emission, reduce water supply by 70 or water consumption by 72%. So it's a tremendously uh, uh, effective high percentage of effectiveness almost as good as the, uh, the, the, the COVID vaccine that is struggling to uh, get into, their, our, into our arms these days. The same building on the east-west side, you see a rooftop turbine. 
So this is an example of what I'm talking about is combining traditional system and methodology, the wind towers or the wind catchers to cool the building down naturally without any artificial energy usage. And hybridizing and giving more effective or enhancing by uh, co using contemporary uh, engineering uh, by putting these yellow, uh, let's say, turbine at the top. Now, I'm not sure whether this turbine is actually operated by electricity or only by the natural uh, 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 forces. But even if it was done using electricity to turn the, turn the turbine, as long as that use of electricity is counterbalanced by uh, abundance uh, savings in cooling by air conditioning, by more effectively drawing the air out than uh, traditional wind tower, then I think it's good use of artificial energy sources. So this is represent, uh, this example represent a very much of what I like you to think about. And in fact, that I've given you assignment, research assignment to the fact that I want you to investigate and learn the traditional natural method and to find whether that some of the current contemporary mechanical artificial system could be used in combination to further enhance one, the traditional systems capabilities, two, to reduce the energy dependence in contemporary system by using the traditional system as a basis and using the contemporary system as a system of aid to that traditional system. This is an example, another example of that. This looked like some kind of, I cannot say, it's not a really flying saucer look, it's really more like a jet uh, airplane uh, look, but this is actually a, a large size theater <coughs> in France, in the city of Saint Etienne. And uh, it's a, actually quite big building, but most of the theater is actually buried underground uh, or half of it is uh, uh, below the ground. What you may be seeing is only a part of a building. So it's like kind of like a tip of iceberg, let's say. But this sweeping roof is working as a giant wind catcher. Winds drawn in from uh, the view that you see at the bottom. And then as a section on the top, it will go and kind of funnel out at the back end or left side of the building or the image here. And then while it's going from the right to the left side, of the top image, the air goes through the building, through the theater and bringing cold air and pulling out the hot air out. And much of that cold air is probably done by the shade uh, uh, given by this enormous cantilever roof structure. Uh, and uh, that itself really, uh, will cool the building down, okay? I mean, cool the outside air before it enters the building itself. So uh, I want to uh, end the lecture here and I hope that uh, uh, this would help your research and later your speculative design. So I see you next Monday and we have a guest lecture next Monday as well uh, at the beginning. Uh, and then uh, he, he was Stephen uh, Bellagrini, 
I forget his last name. It's in the syllabus. He will talk about uh, some of the uh, kind of uh, energy sufficient, uh, efficient design in uh, uh, in different parts of arid areas in the Middle East. Okay, see you next week. Have a great weekend.